The neutral zone? We have no authorization to enter it. Did you order a course change, Spock? No, sir. You did. Bridge to all decks. Welcome aboard Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. I'm Scott Nance. And I may be Steve Morris, or I may be an alien pretending to be Steve Morris. Hmm, that sounds like a theme that has been explored before on the original series of Star Trek. And this time, we are covering the animated series episode, The Survivor, which is an episode I have not seen. I was trying to think back, Steve Morris, about when did I see The Survivor? Animated episodes are not episodes that I've gone back to to rewatch over and over again, not even in recent years. And as I'm watching The Survivor, I, I think I it wasn't a rewatch. It was a watch. I don't even know if I ever saw The Survivor before. <laughs> so this is actually, this is a new thing on Enterprise Incidents, which is you are not reviewing a show from your past, a well-loved story that you know like the back of your hand. You are reviewing a show from your present that you just saw for the first time. I don't think I ever have had an experience since, you know, I've I've been watching Star Trek for all these, all these years where as a grown-up, I was watching something new that had to do with the original series. Of course, it's a little bit of a, a push because we're in animated series territory. But I mean, I'm really, Steve, I, w- I, I was racking my brain and I was trying to think of like, was there a character, like the image of, uh, you know, the survivor, you know, we'll get into that, uh, the name of the alien, like, like trying to like associate the image or, or whatever the dialogue with like, uh, maybe I did see, and I just don't remember. And I honestly, and you know, Steve, I have a really good memory. Yes, you do. <laughs> and I could not remember anything about this episode. And I went, "Wow!" And I think, in terms of discovering something brand new, like 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 discovering a, a lost Beatles track on a bootleg album, and and discovering something brand new about the original series. And I thought this episode was. Very well done. I the the thing I've said for every single episode of the animated series so far still holds. They're they like I don't think the animated series is as great or moving as the original series, but every single episode has been solidly Star Trek, and this one's no exception. This is absolutely solidly Star Trek. Solid is a great way to describe it because uh, you know you had you had certain episodes like like yesteryear which was really, really special and beyond the farthest star, which I of course do remember seeing and, and thought that really, really held up and was really impressed by how much they put into this 24 minute episode. In this case there, yeah, certainly there are, there are elements of the survivor that harken back to the original series and, you know, we'll get into all that, but I was really impressed by how, how grown up it was for a Saturday morning animated series and how, uh, y- you know, it's, it, I mean, there's certainly action and adventure, but there is also just a very, I would say, moving story that I was thinking, well, what if this was a live action episode? Like, you could have a great guest starring role for a woman to play one of the main characters in this episode, like you had with, like, you know, a, you know Marla MacGyver's or... Yeah. I really just kind of perked up when I realized I had never seen this episode before. And it was really, really cool. I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed it. So The Survivor aired on October 13th, 1973, making it the 85th episode of Star Trek to air. It was production number 22005, with, which made it actually the fifth episode of the animated series to be produced or to go into production. Because like you pointed out, Steve, you know, unlike live action where you're shooting you know, one episode at a time, you know, maybe you do a pickup from an earlier episode once in a while, you know, these animated episodes were all kind of done, you know, all being worked on around the same time. So it's kind of hard to pin down like, nope, this is the fifth one produced. But anyway, that is the production number. And what makes The Survivor unique is that it is written by James Schmerer. And this is the first episode of the animated series to be written by a newcomer to Star Trek. You don't have a writer or a director who worked on the original series. And James Schmerer had done TV episodes for Mannix, The Mod Squad, 
the $6 million man, Chips, MacGyver, T.J. Hooker. Got to throw in T.J. Hooker because of William Shatner. And this was another situation where because the writer's strike did not affect animation, Schmerer had reached out to Dorothy Fontana and said, hey, can I write for the animated series? And Fontana said, as I recall, Jim called and said he was interested in pitching to us. I liked what he pitched and passed it on to Gene Roddenberry, who had him in, in for a meeting as well and then approved the assignment. Jim had done some form of animation in the past, so he knew it was possible from stage to sell, as it were. The shapeshifter idea had been done before in the original series, but this was a different one with a more personal heart to it. That is from Dorothy Fontana herself, mm. who was the story editor and associate producer on the animated series. Um, would you like to know some of the things going on in the world? When yes, absolutely. Aired? Or I should say right before this aired, because as you said, it aired on October 13th. Uh, so on October 7th, and this is <clears throat> what we were talking about last week, is we have just entered into the Yom Kippur War with Syria and Egypt attacking the state of Israel. And on October 7th, Iraq nationalized the holdings of two oil companies, Exxon and Mobil, to show a support for Egypt and Syria in their war against Israel. And we should say, and this is really true of every one of the of these first wars between the Arab countries and Israel, is the odds were, and all the world's predictions were there was no way Israel could survive the attack from these much larger, much more powerful countries. On the second day of the conflict, the 162nd Division of Israel's Defense Force destroyed 60 tanks of the Egyptian 25th Brigade in a battle on the Sinai Peninsula. They lost only three of their tanks. On October 8th, tank, Syrian tanks were sweeping across the Golan Heights, and Egypt is continuing to advance in Sinai. And at, and at this time, the Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir, and this is really, really scary. She authorizes the defense mis minister, Moshe Dayan, to assemble Israel's 13 nuclear missiles and distribute them to the Air Force units to be used if the Egyptian and Syrian armies actually penetrate Israel itself. You know what? You're, you're reading all this about what was going on the week leading up to the airing of The Survivor. And you, you've been building up to all of this for the last few weeks. We've been doing animated series episodes. And just this morning... As we're recording this, as I was, uh, you know, uh, get it, getting my notes together and looking up some other things online, I saw that at the Berlin Film Festival, uh, Helen Mirren was doing a press conference because she is playing Golda Meir wow. in a new movie about this very conflict. Wow. And I just thought, wow, this is exactly what Steve was talking about on Enterprise Incidents these last few weeks. And here she is doing this press conference. The movie is having its world premiere at the Berlin Film Festival. It seems like the kind of role that Helen Mirren, who had already won an Academy Award for playing the Queen, in the Queen, <laughs> right? You know, where it's like totally like Oscar bait. But in addition to to dealing with this conflict, it is also, and I didn't know this at the time. She was undergoing very extensive cancer treatment because she was a chain smoker and had lung cancer. So that's the film, and that's what I can't wait to see. Totally going off track here, but uh, I, I just thought it was so interesting that that I was reading about this this morning after hearing you talk about it these last uh, few weeks on the show. Well, that's been what's so been so interesting about doing this show is seeing like the connections between the news of the day in the late 60s and now we're into the early 70s and things that are going on with us today. Um, also on October 8th, you know, in Great Britain, the BBC, both radio and television, was a monopoly. And while there were some pirate radio stations, which we actually talked about, I think, on Enterprise Incidents, there were no legal ones until October 8th, 1973, when the LBC became the first legal radio station breaking the monopoly of the BBC. Wow. Mm. On October 9th, Cape Kennedy in Florida went back to its original name of Cape Canaveral. On the third day of the Yom Kippur War, Syrian missiles hit settlements in the Golan, and in retaliation, Israel sent seven F-4 Phantoms to Syria, where they destroyed Syrian army headquarters. On October 10th, and again, this is just... This isn't the same as things that we're talking about today, but there's some strange connection because Vice President Spiro Agnew, who we mentioned in our last episode, 
He pled no contest to tax evasion. There's tons of accusations of bribery to him. And finally, he writes a letter to President Nixon that says, as you are aware, the accusations against me cannot be resolved without a long, divisive, and debilitating struggle. I have concluded that, painful as it is to me and my family, it is in the best interest of the nation that I relinquish the office of the vice presidency. Wow. Hmm. I remember that. Like, I remember seeing all that stuff on the news, you know, I was like five, six years old and, and, uh, you know, my parents talking about, it. I remember Spiro Agnew, uh, of course I remember Nixon. <laughs> so yeah. There's by the way, a really good podcast that I think Rachel Maddow did about Spiro Agnew. And it's just the shenanigans that went on are absolutely crazy. And what's so funny, it's, it's almost forgotten because we're, it's so overshadowed by Watergate. You yeah. Know? Oh, sure. But if, yeah. In fact, there's this huge scandal before, before that. Uh, also, on October 10th, the Soviet Union begins airlifting military supplies to Egypt and Syria. So they are taking the side against the state of Israel. The Senate votes 75 to 20 to pass the War Powers Act, prohibiting the president from committing American troops without congressional authorization for more than 90 days. This is something that no longer exists because of post 9-11. They just said, hey, you could do whatever you want. So the <laughs> yeah, yeah. Congress gave up their power of controlling the military. Nixon vetoed the War Power Act because he wanted to be able to do whatever he wanted in Vietnam, and his veto was overwritten. Uh, and then this one's just crazy. On October 11th, the White House gets a call from 10 Downing Street because the prime minister wants to talk to the president about the situation in Israel. President Nixon was too drunk to go to the phone. And so Henry Kissinger took the call and said, oh, boy, on October 12th, in response to the Soviets sending weapons to is to Syria and Egypt, Nixon authorized Operation Nickel Grass, an airlift of replacement weapons to Israel. So this is getting really, really scary. Arab nations then responded by cutting oil exports to the United States. And on the same day, U.S. Representative and Minority Leader Gerald Ford was nominated by Nixon to succeed Agnew as the vice president. And on October 13th, the day that this actually aired, the Syrians were pushed back out of the Golan Heights. Man, what a week. <laughs> yeah. What this a week surrounding this animated episode of, uh, of Star Trek. <laughs> um, so shall we get into the survivor? Let's get into the survivor. Let's lighten things up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So we are near the Romulan neutral zone and we are pursuing a scout, a small ship that has fallen victim to a meteor shower. And once again, we are trying to rescue someone from a smaller ship. And that was uh, literally after the last episode where we were trying to uh, rescue someone from a smaller ship. So once again, the star date is 5143.3. And, uh, you know, I think it's really been interesting to sort of go and like take these animated episodes, look at the star dates and sort of like like pop, uh, uh, place them into into the original series by going in star date order. So there have been a few episodes where we covered that took place between the empath and and the Mark of Gideon, and uh, this is another one. There was a big gap between those two star dates and those two episodes. So, uh, so that is where the survivor takes place. And what we hear is that, strangely enough, this ship is re is registered to someone named Carter Winston, who has been missing for five years. And they beam him aboard, and yeah, that's Carter Winston, who says, "It seems you gentlemen know me." And we especially know the person who who voiced Carter Winston. It is Ted Knight, Ted Knight, who was a good friend of Filmation founder and animated series producer Lou Scheimer. Uh, he didn't get an on-screen credit, and it's believed that he did this as a favor to Scheimer, as he did other Filmation characters as well. Of course, everyone knows Ted Knight is a two-time Emmy winner for playing Ted Baxter on 165 episodes of one of my favorite television shows of all time, a show that I watched in real time back in the 70s as I was growing up, Mary Tyler Moore. What a great show. And I got to say, I've caught some episodes streaming over these years, Steve, and that show absolutely holds up. And it's oh, remarkable yeah. how ahead of its time it was, really. No. Um, you know, but he was also on TV shows like The Untouchables, Journey to the Center of the Earth, The Love Boat. And another show that I watched into the 80s, Too Close for Comfort, where he played Henry Rush. He passed away in 1986. And of course, who can forget his iconic role in one of the absolute greatest comedies of all time? I'm curious, Steve, 
Have you and Johnny Roca covered Caddyshack on the Cinephiles? We have not covered Caddyshack. Um, Caddyshack is a very interesting movie because, well, I'll, and I'll just, the, the world's briefest digression, which is that the thing that is great about movie is that movie is everything that is not the main character. Yeah, right. The actual main character of Caddyshack is the caddy, whose name I don't even remember. Yeah, What's right. great about the movie is Ted Knight and Roddy D. Jagerfield and Bill Murray and Chevy Chase. That's what's great. All the supporting characters are great. That. that movie, so it came out in 1980, absolutely holds up. Still one of the funniest movies ever made. And it, you know, Remember when you, me, and John covered Airplane on the Cinephiles yes. and we like couldn't stop laughing? I feel like that's an episode where – like the, the majority of the deep dive discussion on Caddyshack will be made up of laughter and maybe 40% will be actual dialogue criticizing the film. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and it's obvious that this Carter Winston guy is a really important person. And this most interesting thing that's said is said by Dr. McCoy, who says, I'm especially honored to meet you, Mr. Winston. My daughter was going to school on service about 10 years ago when the crop failure occurred. The entire population would have starved, Jim. If Winston here hadn't used his personal fortune to bring in enough food and goods to carry them through the crisis. So a couple things about this. So this is the first time in, you know, quote unquote, original series characters where we were hearing Dr. McCoy mention his daughter. Now, he does not mention her by name. But if you recall, Steve, when we were doing our deep dive of The Way to Eden, we were talking all about the history of that episode, which started out as an episode called Joanna which was at that time being written by Dorothy D.C. Fontana and Joanna was McCoy's daughter. We were going to meet McCoy's daughter, Joanna, in the third season. But of course, that was notoriously rewritten to eventually hit the television screen as the infamous original series episode, The Way to Eden. And boy, what a journey that was. But, but you, you know, like I said, Steve, because I... Again, I'm shocked to be able to say this, but also excited like to to discover a like quote unquote new episode of you know the original series that I'd never seen before. And you know, hearing Captain Kirk, you know, hearing Shatner's voice say, you know, Captain James C. Kirk of the Starship Enterprise, you know, and and he he mentions his his crew, and it just felt like, wow, this really does feel like Star Trek. And you know, Shatner has said those lines many, many times. And he's just got it down, and whether it's in live action or animated form, he still has it down. I think the thing about giving McCoy a daughter, it just seems weird to me because it's like, well, why add this really significant piece of character thing if they're literally not going to do anything with it? You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's put in as a throwaway, and I think that's a really weird use of that moment, you know? Yeah, it, um, it is. I mean, maybe they could have, like, had – her actually be part of the story, you know, instead of just like, oh yeah, my daughter, you know. But the other thing I was thinking about when when it was talking about how uh, Winston sort of saved people from starvation using his personal fortune, I, I kind of went back hmm, to Conscience of the King, where people were dying, and in that case, you know, uh, the, you know, Governor Kodos decided who was going to live and who was going to die. Completely different scenario. But that's sort of the, the crop failure failure uh, in this one on Cerebrus uh, 10 years ago did make me think a little bit of the conscience of the king. Sure, that makes sense. It's also interesting that at least up to this point now, we can track the economics of Star Trek continue to have money into the animated series because this is clearly a rich guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is one person aboard who should be especially happy to learn you are alive, Mr. Winston. Lieutenant Ann Norad of our security detail. My fiance. Yeah, so a, a member of the security detail, another female member of the security detail. So just a couple episodes after Uhura, you know, sort of got her troops together, her all female security contingent to save Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in the Lorelei signal, we're meeting yet another member of the security detail who was a woman. And maybe she was actually part of the landing party in the Lorelei signal. We just didn't get to meet her. So here you have a situation on the Enterprise where a female crew member uh, is reunited with a long lost fiance. Now, what episode does that make you think of? Uh, what are little girls made of? Exactly, yes. The Enterprise has rescued a living legend, 
The foremost space trader of our time, Carter Winston has acquired a dozen fortunes only to use his wealth time and again to assist Federation colonies in times of need or disaster. Seems like this Carter Winston is a really good guy. <laughs> We're in sickbay where McCoy is finishing the exam and something seems a little off with the instruments. Instrument seems a little off. I've uh, never gotten quite this reading from a human before. And he's like, you know, so like sort of you're setting up that something is is not quite right. Right. But, uh, you know, McCoy's, uh, you know, because there is a personal angle to to this person because of his daughter, uh, he's not taking it that seriously yet. And then in comes Ann Norrid. Ann Norrid is voiced by, can you guess, Steve? Michelle Nichols. It's right. It sounds just like Michelle Nichols, actually. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I actually, like, if you go back and you watch uh, Laura Y signal in, in the background when they first get down to the planet and they're firing their, their little hand phasers, you, 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 there, is, there is actually a character who kind of looks like uh, Ann Nord. So, um, but, you know, again, this is what I was thinking. Like, if they had done this as a live action episode, like, this could have been a really good brawl for a female guest star. I think, and I'm, maybe this is just a spoiler of what I think of the episode in general, but I think this would have been a great uh, full-length episode. And I think its weakness is that it's just too short to actually do what it should do. Exactly. Um, it's uh, not long enough to really let the the, the personal stakes simmer, uh, like in, you know, What a Little Girl's Made Of, um, yeah. or, or The Man Trap, which is another episode that this kind of, because if you're dealing with the shapeshifter sort of resembles well and with an old flame and with the relationship it's because and this is you know it goes back to this thing i said uh, a long time ago of like the what are the three big things for me to make a great star trek episode is an interesting science fiction idea well we have that here mm -hmm. a sense of adventure we have that here sure and real emotional stakes and which we have that don't here. quite yeah nah I, it's not emotional. It doesn't. It doesn't work. Emo I mean, it's there, but it isn't. It doesn't have an emotional resonance for me because we just don't have time to develop this relationship. You know. You know. Uh, so far in in the animated series, I, I mean, when you look at a, uh, an episode like one of our planets is missing, where they they put a lot into that episode, and, yeah, and it worked. Um, but I agree with you as much as I, and again because I was discovering really the survivor for the first time, I was really surprised, pleasantly surprised by how personal this episode actually was and, and how uh, uh, heartfelt, you know, it, it, it was, but I do, I agree with your, your criticism that you've said about how, you know, this is a situation where the running time really is a hindrance. I'm sorry, Al. I never thought we would meet again. And we hear that his ship was disabled and he crashed. And it's like, again, what, there's another, because this is also a shapeshifter story, there's another episode that this r reminds me of. What do you think that might be? Uh, let's see. Let's see. So the man trap, uh, what are little girls made up because of the fiance thing, shapeshifter. I don't know. You got someone who, someone who crashed and learned how to shapeshift after he was injured. And that's whom God's destroyed. Oh, oh, sure. Right. Yes, absolutely. It's over between us, Anne. I'm sorry, I can't explain why, but I can't marry you, ever. So so here is a Saturday morning cartoon, an animated show dealing with uh, a breakup. Uh, again, uh, it, it's you could tell that even though this is a new writer to Star Trek, that he was told, just like everybody else so far, just write, write for Star Trek, write a Star Trek episode that's just obviously shorter, but don't dumb it down. Don't cater to the Saturday morning audience. Just write a Star Trek episode, and that's what this is. You know what's interesting, and and of course, there's no way to know the answer to this question. But I think the thing we admire most about the animated series is just what you said—that they really didn't dumb it down. They really tried to make it real Star Trek. Yep. My question is: If they hadn't done that, would there have been more episodes? Well, would more kids have watched it because obviously oh, it wasn't a hit right. because they only did a season and a half. So. If it if they had not done this thing that we like, would it have gone on longer? That's a really really good question. If they had if they had done a show where they 
you know, cater to the Saturday morning audience. Yeah. I do not think that these episodes will be holding up to the kind of scrutiny nope. that we're doing with the uh, that we've done with the original series, and we probably would have not done <laughs> the animated series on Enterprise incidents. But I also I remember when we were doing our discussion uh, with the writers of the animated series book, it was never intended to go beyond two seasons. Oh, really? You know, they they had oh. done. They had done the 16 episodes for the first season, and by the time they got to the second season, it was only six episodes, and by then, Fontana left. Uh, um, uh, 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 let's see, uh, Hal Sutherland wasn't directing the episodes anymore, and uh, you know, Roddenberry had already moved on. So, so it was never sort of in, it was never planned to go beyond the, those, you know, that season and a half. But, uh, you know, just like what I said about the original series, how I was glad that it stopped at season three, I'm glad that the animated series stopped when it did. Well, because I actually think if they had made it more of a kid show and if it had been the biggest hit in the history of Saturday morning cartoons, there's probably no Star Trek The Motion Picture. Okay, yeah, maybe, perhaps, or maybe there was. Then the people, then the people that are in, well, it wouldn't be the same because the people that are into Star Trek are kids who love this kid show. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. in that alternate universe, things go in a different direction. Possibly. Anyway. Yep. Uh-huh. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> Kirk heads down to his, his quarters to work on some reports, and there's a knock, and in comes uh, Carter Winston. Uh, we have some conversation about the damage to his ship, and then as Kirk is talking about this, Winston does this strange thing. He crosses his arms, he starts glowing, and he turns into this crazy tentacled alien. You know, when that happens... I thought, of course, immediately, I thought of the man trap. Right. And, you know, you sort of hear that that music cue whenever the Salt Vampire changed into somebody mm -hmm. else. You hear that music cue. And I, I had that in my head when I was watching the, uh, the, the this alien, who we don't know the name of yet, turn into Captain Kirk. And then I thought, wow, now this really feels like an episode of the original series, because how many times did we see captain kirk duplicated you know and what a little girl's made of of course the enemy within like you said whom gods destroy and i went boy this really does feel like an episode of the original series he immediately takes kirk out puts him lays him down on his bed and becomes captain kirk uh we're back we're up on the bridge and kirk walks in and sulu's like i thought you were going to your cabin <laughs> like i'd be like mind your own business <laughs> mr sulu <Yeah. laughs> mr sulu lay in a direct course for radar three through the Romulan neutral zone, sir? That was the order, Helmsman. Um, and obviously there's a reaction about going through the neutral zone, and he says... But it does not seem prudent to take the risk of trespass into the zone. Mr. Spock, I've spoken to Winston on this at some length. He has assured me it is absolutely vital to get to Ratar 3 in the shortest possible time. The survival of the entire planetary population may depend on it. So we're going to head off into the neutral zone. And that brings us to the end of Act 1. <laughs> It's so funny that I, I think when we had uh, the sci-fi sisters on and they were talking about, uh, you know, secure that Yahura is the first person to secure the transporter room. And it's like, you know, we really should start Starfleet really should have some better rules and regulations to stop <laughs> stuff like this from happening. And it goes on. I mean, like it like, you know, how many times does data almost destroy the Enterprise? Like there's so many things where we should have yeah. some better safety features at Starfleet. For sure. Yes. We're in Act 2, and as Spock is giving a log about what's going on, we see Captain Kirk wake up on his bed and comes onto the bridge, sees some weird numbers, seems a little bit confused, is confused that he fell asleep in his cabin, which has never happened to him before, and then finds out that we're in the neutral zone, and he says, We have no authorization to enter it. Did you order a course change, Spock? No, sir. You did. And I like Kirk's reaction. Ridiculous. No captain of Starfleet would do that unless it was a matter of life and death. I believe that was the reason you gave, Captain. And then I like that they basically go, let's go to the replay. <laughs> All right, now, now, you know what? Here's what I thought of with the replay. So that actually makes perfect sense that they had a replay because remember in court martial. Sure. So, yeah. so there is a running log of what is happening on the bridge that runs 24-7 so they can go back to it like they did in court martial. And now you have a situation where just like with that episode, you know, you're able to see and sort of rewind. And I thought that was actually a, a probably not a I, I would say it was not a deliberate <laughs> thing, but it was certainly something that sort of ties into the original series with like, yep, let's just replay what happened on the bridge. 
You know what just occurred to me is what this actually relates to. it Because uh, before I was going, well, why would they have this thing? And now I just suddenly went, oh, this is the black box. This is the black box on airplanes. Exactly. And, and so I just went because of my good friend, the internet, and went, well, when was that invented? It was actually invented in 1954. So it makes sense that we would record what goes on on the bridge. Mr. Spock, I don't remember giving those orders. I left the bridge, went to my quarters, and fell asleep. That's all. I really like this. This is the thing. I think all these are good Star Trek elements, and they're so within the characters. Because the moment Kirk realizes something might be wrong with him, he says, yeah, I've become subject to blackouts. I'm a possible danger to the safety of the ship. I can't allow that. That's full Kirk. I yep, think. that is absolutely full Kirk. This that's that's what I mean. I was watching and I was going like, "Yep." I mean, you know, they they animated or not, it is absolutely Star Trek. And so we're in sick bay, and in comes Winston and is talking to McCoy, and then he does his little arm cross things, turns into the alien, now takes out McCoy, and then Anne enters and. Now she's going to talk to the Winston slash McCoy. Uh, I like that 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 Nora goes into sick bay asking Doctor McCoy for advice. You know, kind of made me think of uh, when in uh, the Deadly Years, uh, when the uh, a lieutenant who was starting to have uh, issues with aging mm. goes in and says, yeah. "Oh, I, you know, I can't hear." Um, you know, people look up to McCoy. I like that. Sure. I will say a totally minor writing uh, thing. There is no reason why Winston should have gone and taken out McCoy at this moment. It's only it's only happening because of the things that we want to happen after that, which is this conversation with Anne, and then later the interaction where he becomes the table. Yep. <laughs> Doctor, what do I do? I still love him. Well, if he asks you to forget him, I think you should try to do just that. And of course, we know that this is Winston talking. Right. And then Kirk and Spock enter. I want a complete medical examination, Bones. Something's just happened. I'm afraid I'll have to make it later today, Captain. Which instantly is like completely out of character. If, someone, if, if the captain comes in and says, I need a complete medical exam right now, the doctor would say, Jim, what's wrong? You know? Yeah, yeah. And he would drop, uh, drop everything he was doing <laughs> yeah. to you know, follow his orders and also you know, examine his friend. And we hear that he's finished up the, the exams on Carter Winston, and we ask, Are you sure there is no possibility you made an error? Well, there's always that possibility. I'll go over them again if you like. I love Spock and Kirk go into the corridor. Did you notice Dr. McCoy's reaction when I asked him if there was any possibility he might have made an error? He said there's always that possibility. And that's not like Bones at all. I'd love that after five years in space together, Kirk and Spock immediately pick up something is wrong with McCoy. Like they they play along and as soon as they just step right out of the corridor and like something's up here. I, I really have to say, in some ways, this is one of the best written episodes, I think, that we've seen of the animated series structurally. Everything works. Like this all is making logical sense, you know, with a couple of little nitpicks here and there. They go back into sick bay and McCoy has disappeared. And then we hear a groan and we find him unconscious on the floor. And he says, I must have taken a little nap. Doctor, you are a man of curious habits, but I have never known you to nap on the laboratory floor. And you know what, James uh, Schmerer, like, I don't know if this is his line or if this is something that that Fontana did when she, you know, updated the script, the script, but they are talking like they talk in the original series, like that there are these like little digs, a man of yeah. curious habits, like these are the characters, like you said, yeah. uh, it's it's well written, certainly in that in that regard. And now they figured it out. All right, Winston, you can come out now. And he's looking around and he goes over to one of the exam tables and says, I suggest you show yourself, Winston, or whatever you are. Did you say I'm a man of curious habits? Jim's talking to a table. Now, A, this is exactly what you just said. This is the little digs. This is the characters coming through with their sense of humor. I think it's great. I also think if you're in your sick bay, and another table suddenly appears. I think McCoy <laughs> yeah. would probably notice it. Yeah, you would notice it. Yeah, this is a uh, yeah. where the nitpicking little part comes in. Yeah, but it makes for a good bit. And Kirk grabs a vial of acid and says, "It will burn through almost anything but this crystal. If you've never seen it work, I'll demonstrate on you." Now let me ask you a question: When when Kirk threatens to pour the acid on the table, unless Winston changes back, like what did you think of that move? Did you, did, did you not think like that was very, that was very, you know, like a, a Kirk move, like that he would threaten 
do this or, you know, you're going to be out yep. of here. No, this is this is Kirk saying, I will destroy it. Yes, I mean, this exactly. Is the, this is aggressive Kirk, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is Kirk threatening to take down the entire uh, planet on uh, Vendikar. Or no, whatever the other one is. Uh, 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 oh, Amini R7. Amini R7, yeah. And now the table turns back into a, this squid thing. A Vendorian doctor. Their ability to rearrange their molecular structure into anything with the same general size and mass and their practice of deceit as a way of life puts them off limits. But unfortunately, <laughs> taking out a Ventorian is tough because he basically attacks them and wipes them out, just tosses them around like ragdolls. What do you think of the Ventorian, the, the design of the Ventorian? Uh, it's good. I think it's a good, I think the biggest thing about it is like, this is the most, I will say, you know what, here, I'll put it this way. I think in the original series, when they tried to show stuff that was really, really alien, like the Horda, you end up with a big, funny looking carpet, you or, know, or you uh, uh, like the Bugatu or the Gorn or yeah, the Salt Vampire, someone in a costume it's or in a suit. Or you have a, a situation where it's like a, a an energy force, so it's a visual effect, like the alien entity in Day of the Dove, or the right. Organians at the end of Emerald of Mercy. Right. So I'm like companion. watching this again, what seems like the first time, going, "Wow, the Vendorians are unlike anything we've seen in the original series," and this is why the animated series actually was was really good for Star Trek a, a, another situation where you're able to to do something you couldn't do in live action I mean it, it's so hard because the animation is so cheap and it, you know so simple like as a comic book reader you've seen all sorts of aliens that were much cooler than this sure you know but but I think in terms of Star Trek this is the most alien a, alien we've really seen in a lot mm. of ways so uh the Vendorian escapes and then we see someone has a phaser on Winston. Anne, what are you doing? My job? It isn't hard to guess who the intruder is. You're the only stranger aboard, Carter. And she's distracted for a moment because Kirk is running up. He chops her hand, disarms her, and escapes. Lieutenant Norad, you could have stopped him. Why didn't you fire? I... I couldn't. I knew he had to be the intruder, Captain. But I couldn't harm the image of the man I love. See, this is a situation where the constraints of the running time uh, have a negative impact on what could have been an emotional moment. I mean, yeah, it still works, and it, it's a it's a great scene for an animated episode, a great personal scene. But imagine if this was live action, how powerful that could have been. Yeah, it, it's it's so. It goes into this rule of writing, which is show, don't tell, is that we're being told that she's in love with him, but we don't really see it. You know, we don't see a relationship. We don't see the building of the relationship and the evolution of Carter Winston's character, which is really important through the course of this episode. We understand the steps, but you aren't emotionally involved in it, or I'm not emotionally involved in it as yeah. it's going along. Lieutenant, he is not the man you loved. Carter Winston is dead. I know that, too. And then as we're having this conversation and, you know, sending out the security alert to basically, because even more than in the man trap, it's not just that this creature can assume any human form. It can assume any form, you know? Yeah, right. So it's table and sick bay. <laughs> yeah. And just as this happens, we're in red alert because we find out that two Romulan battle cruisers are heading right towards us. And that is the end of act two. And so this is the first appearance of the Romulans in the animated series. And so the Romulans are flying what look like Klingon battle cruisers. So I went, wait a minute. Like, why didn't they just use the uh, the bird of prey that we saw in, right. in Bounce of Terror? So then I thought, well, okay. And when you got to the third season, when you get to the Enterprise incident, our namesake episode, you hear that the Romulans are using Klingon design. So then I went, wait a minute, and then I start to worry about my theory about the star dates uh, mm. not holding up under scrutiny. So then I went back. So here you have an episode of the animated series where the Romulans are using the Klingon chips. So when I went back to the episodes in star date order, the survivor does in fact take place after the Enterprise incident. So okay. the using the Klingon design for their starship still holds. Like, it's not like this took place before the Enterprise incident. And then Scotty is like, oh my God, that's a Klingon ship. So it all 
everything is still working in terms of the starting order thing. (laughs) I am so relieved to hear that. I was very concerned. (laughs) (laughs) So we come back in Act 3, and we have a call with the Romulan commander who says, You appear to have a propensity for trespassing in the neutral zone, Captain Kirk. Which is true. (laughs) I think that that makes a good point. That is an excellent point of of what the Romulan commander is alluding to is balance of terror, is the deadly years. And like I said, this took place just, this actually took place, so so if the survivor takes place between the empath and Mark of Gideon, it actually takes place two episodes after the Enterprise incident. So that's that's at least three documented moments in the original series when the Enterprise veered into the neutral zone. And they would do so again in the upcoming, according to the star dates, the upcoming episode, The Way to Eden. Yeah, I think the Romulan commander has a real point. And what's funny <laughs> is, so so I totally think, you know, this all works in terms of the choices Kirk makes, but there is a certain point. It's like, no, you really have violated a really important treaty. Mm-hmm. And then you fight your way out. You just, there's this starting a war, you know, like, like this, the choices here are really pretty rough. You will surrender your ship, Captain. We will release you and your crew at the nearest outpost that guards the neutral zone. So the Romulan commander, it's not documented, even in the animated series book, like who actually voices. So it could be James Doohan. It might even be Ted Knight, because like I mentioned, uh. Ted Knight did a variety of voices for Filmation. And since he was already doing Carter Winston, uh, he might have done the Romulan commander as well. It doesn't sound like Jimmy doing to me. Yeah, like I agree. Uh, it actually sounds like a different voice. And Kirk says, yeah, let me just inform my crew. And he signs off. And we're still looking around for the Vendorian and can't find him. And what they basically say is he set us up. That's what happened, is that this was he was working for the Romulans. And then he says, Open a hailing frequency, Lieutenant Morris. So, Lieutenant Morris. So, this is the very first appearance of Lieutenant Morris, again, another character like Arix, who is at Navigations, who probably would not have been possible in live action form, at least not convincingly. So Lieutenant Morris is a sort of communications, well, she is a communications officer, and uh, she is a relief to Lieutenant Uhura. You ever wonder, like, man, Uhura is, like, always there, and but then you've seen, you know, other episodes like the Doomsday Machine where she wasn't there. But, uh, but so she's, like, the relief for Uhura. Of course, she is voiced by Majel Barrett, and according to the press release, Lieutenant Morris was a Cation who served aboard the USS Hood before joining the Enterprise. I like how in the press releases they give backstories to some of these characters, even in animated form. I thought that was awesome. And we call over to the Romulan ship, and they're ready for him to, you know, give them the Enterprise. Wrong assumption, Commander. Captain, you are outnumbered, outgunned, and in the wrong. And, and this is where I actually, to some degree, agree with the Romulan commander. Like, yes, they had a spy that made this happen, but he is outnumbered, outgunned, and in the wrong. And we talk about the spy and that he was a Vandorian. And finally, Kirk says, I will not surrender my ship. That's our Kirk. <laughs> Down in engineering, there's some dude ripping out some wires out of some system. What are you doing? And now Mr. Scott gets knocked out. Let's, let's just examine for a moment how less than 24 minutes for the entire duration of this running time, you have a situation where a crew member... Uh, is reunited with her fiance, who's not really her fiance. You have that that being is a shapeshifter that could take on not just any form, phys- you know, uh, life form on the Enterprise, but even a physical form like an inanimate object, like a, a desk in in Starfleet. Now you are also dealing with the Romulans and a potential war breaking out. Uh, there is a lot going on here in the Survivor, and for the most part. I think it handles everything quite well, even with some you know minor nitpicks. I think overall it all works. Yeah, I agree. Um, and now the shields are down, and we call down to engineering, and Mr. Scott's not there, and we hear the shuttle bay doors are opening, which means the Vendorian's trying to escape. We need him. Override the control and shut those doors. Doors closing, sir. Spock, take the con. Talk to the Romulans. Try to stall them and send a security team to the hangar deck. I'll be in engineering. And down in engineering, we hear that this is going to take at least two hours to fix the shields. 
And once again, we have another confrontation between Ann Nord with her phaser, who has caught Winston. You're not getting past me this time. I've learned my lesson. Yes. He said you were like that. Practical as well as warm and lovely. And what we find out is that a, this is the Vendorian who nursed Winston back to health or tried to after he crashed on the planet. And the other thing we find out is that the more time a Vendorian spends in a, in a particular form, the more they take on the a- emotions, attitudes, and knowledge of the person they're imitating. So let me ask you this, Steve. So you have a, an alien that shifts its form. And at the same time, the longer it stays in that form, starts to take on the qualities, the attributes, the emotions, the feelings. It becomes more like the form they've taken on. And that made me think, and it's funny, just watching something so fresh like this, I'm thinking of all these other episodes. And yeah, you could say, well, it's derivative, derivative of this and it's derivative of that. But then I thought of the Kelvins from By Any Other Name. Of course, sure. Because when they, the longer, and this happens to be sort of what saves the day for the Enterprise to turn around from going to Andromeda, is they're like, all right, let's exploit the fact that they are becoming more and more human. But in this case, in this case, having the Vendorian take on human form, take on Carter Winston's form, you know, like this moment here with Norid. Like the, there's a lot of heart in this moment right here where he's telling her he loved you. He said so much about you. And it's it's a really genuine moment. He's not like trying to like, you know, set her up to knock her phaser out of out of her hand. Like it's a really good moment. And again, pretty, pretty deep for a Saturday morning animated show. So this is where I agree and disagree with you because I okay. agree that all of that is going on. But this is also what I mean by tell, don't show, because I'll tell you another episode or not an episode. What it also really reminds me of is Star Trek, the motion picture and Ilea is that Ilea has taken on the form of or the, the probe has taken on the form of Ilea. But in taking on that form also takes on some of the emotions and has some of the memories. But the difference with this and by any other name and Star Trek, the motion picture is the time is that it's not that we say oh, these guys in it by any other name are starting to get human emotions and reactions and sensations. It's that we see it happening. We have the drunk scene. We see the guy getting irritable. We see the guy getting jealous. We see the that she wants to kiss Kirk. That's all show. Whereas here, and the same with Ilea, as Ilea, who is totally rigid and not human in any way, starts to experience some of the memories with Decker, we see her start to have emotional reactions to those things. Here, he just says, I feel these things, you know, and that's, and again, it's a factor of the kind of show we have, you know, because it's animated and they don't have the budgets to do the things like, you know, little looks or they touch hands or they, and we just don't have the time for her to do something and see him have a reaction to the thing that she's doing or him to start to go and be rigid and cold. And then she does something and he turns back and looks at her. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Or that she, you know, like they they don't do things that make us see this. We're just told that this is how they feel. Look, the 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 exposition of that is to is to take advantage of the very short time that we have to do all of these things. Yep. And again, again, like you've pointed out in past episodes, the animated series, and like we pointed out here, it's a hindrance to the episode. But what I love is that you connected. Uh, not not just to you know by any other name and some of the other episodes we talked about from the original show that you actually took that forward into Star Trek the motion picture. So nice job, my friend. Well, you know what I think it points out is there are th- the, there are themes of both Star Trek and of science fiction that we're going to continue to explore. I mean, like the the notion of what is the nature of human emotion. And can a machine have human emotion? Can Spock have human emotion? Can Data have human emotion? Can a holographic doctor have human emotion? Like these are, this is this is one of the core themes of Star Trek that we're going to yeah. explore forever. His love for you was very strong because I was there. It did not end when he died. I think that's very, very interesting. But then he makes the choice to push her away by showing her his true form. And he asks... Can you love this? Can you love this? Changing its form. 
looking past the physical, ha- have we ha- has this not been a common theme on Absolutely. the very best of the original series, like uh, Metamorphosis and certainly yep. The Devil in the Dark, to see something we don't understand and fear it, and then shift gears when we realize that this is a compassionate being. You know, so in all these other episodes that we've been tying this to, it does tie to Devil in the Dark and Metamorphosis. I, I think that was a, another big surprise that, yeah, sure, uh, it, it's a common theme, but it's a, it's it's been such an important theme of certainly the original series and into the next generation and into Deep Space Nine uh, that I think is missing from some of the more modern Star Trek. Like it, it's all it's all about explosions and space battles and so on these days whereas that that was not what star trek was about back in the day well it's it's so much like again goes to this this is the exploring the interesting science fiction idea the science fiction ideas are shape-shifting taking on the emotions and memories of someone else by shape-shifting and then the science fiction idea is is love tied to our physical bodies and appearances that's yeah. a great and that one also there's the next gen episode where beverly falls in love with the trill And then the body dies and now it's in a female body. And can you love, is that interfere with the love? Sure. You know, like these, but we don't, I, but I will say again, because we don't have the time, I don't think we really engage that much in this question. We ask the question, it's there, but we don't see her struggling with it. We don't see, you know what I mean? We don't develop it in a way that would make it really more powerful, which again, they can't, it's too short. I totally get that. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah, not yeah. possible. And then Kirk comes in with a phaser and it's like, we got him, except that is the moment at which the Romulans open fire. There's a big shake. Kirk and Ann go down and that gives Winston another chance to escape. We're back on the bridge. And I was certain that Kirk was Winston at this moment, just from the way they animated his entrance. And I was, of course, totally wrong. <laughs> Without deflectors, we're just a clay pigeon for them. Practicality does suggest capitulation, Captain. I just got to say, so if I'm a kid watching Star Trek on Saturday morning and I hear Spock say practicality does suggest capitulation, Captain, I'm going to say to myself, what the hell does capitulation mean? <laughs> I mean you know, there's this is very grown up. Well, except as a kid, that means that probably soon after this, you did know what capitulation meant. Exactly. You know? Yes. B- because the context taught you the definition. Captain, the deflector shields are coming up again. That's only one shield. Yes, sir. But it is between us and the Romulans. Mr. Sulu, aim for the propulsion units of the lead Romulan vessel. Prepare to fire phasers and photon torpedoes in combination. And we fire both at the same time. I can't remember if we've ever fired phasers and torpedoes at the same time in the original series. We did not. Not at the same time. They did it a bunch of times in Next Gen on Enterprise yeah. D. But this is the first time we're seeing the uh, double barrel phasers and photon torpedoes in certainly the original series. Strange. We did no damage, but the Romulan is retreating anyway. They may believe we do have their spy. I don't think this makes any sense. I don't <laughs> understand why the Romulans retreat at all. That doesn't, it's, the, you know, they have a chance to take the Enterprise. There's no way they back off at this moment. And then they're certainly not backing off to protect uh, Winston. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, right. Good work, Mr. Scott. That deflector shield went up just in time. But sir, I haven't finished repairing the shield. I told you it'll take hours and it will. And there's a pause and the camera pushes in on Captain Kirk who says, Winston, it is not outside the realm of probability. If he could rearrange his own atoms to become an examination table, one would have to assume he could become a deflector shield. What do you think about this, Scott? Okay, what I think about this is I think back to the conversations we had, particularly during the first season of the original series when we were doing Enterprise Incidents, and we would we would be, we would marvel at just how you know, for lack of a better word, smart Captain Kirk is, and that yes. goes back to you know that whole I hate you know we haven't used this in a long time, so it's going to throw it out that stack of books with legs that we set yep. up Kirk, and we did that uh, podcast at the Vegas convention. Basically, where we we came to the conclusion that Captain Kirk is a nerd and a very, very agile and, uh, you know, uh, alpha male kind of nerd. But I thought that was great that he came up with this idea. That is why Kirk is one of the greatest captains in Starfleet history. Like even Spock didn't come up with that idea. I'm really glad you brought this up because what Kirk has is the ability to the expression I've heard is think around corners. 
Spock doesn't think Spock thinks in more linear fashion. Good point. Kirk thinks in a much more nonlinear fashion. Uh, let me ask you a different question. In your head canon, before this episode, what was a deflector shield? Like, what did you picture in your mind as what a deflector shield is? Uh, I just thought that it was an energy force emanating from the hull of the Enterprise that protects the Enterprise from, uh, you know, uh, Klingon, Romulan, phaser right. fire, whatever. You know, the Gorn, the, uh, uh, you know, Fazarius, whatever. Me too. It's, exa it's exactly the same thing. It was always some sort of energy field, not a physical thing. Mm -hmm. Is that what they're saying is that it never at any point did I picture that it was actually made out of stuff. Like I never pictured them out repairing an actual physical shield. I pictured them repairing the emitters that created a force field. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. You mean like a like like when it's got to be pretty thin, you know, if it is a physical thing, but it's got to be powerful enough to certainly withstand the the force right. of well, uh, fire from an enemy vessel. I mean, if they're wearing in now in the animated series force fields with their belts that protect them, that to me is related to what the deflector shields are, which is so that's why when they say, oh, Winston could turn himself into a deflector shield, that doesn't make any sense in terms of the way I think of what a deflector shield is. I agree with you on that. This yep. is it's a very silly, geeky stuff, but that's how my brain fails on that. <laughs> Winston now shows up on the bridge. I assume the danger to your ship is over. It is. I'm sorry if I endangered your vessel. Why did you do it? And this is what we find out is that he was sort of a non-important person back on his planet. And the Romulans offered him something he could do of value. What changed your mind about the Romulans? And of course, we know kind of what his answer is going to be. He says, It seems, Captain, that I'm more Carter Winston than I knew. He loved life. He loved Anne. I couldn't allow the Romulans to harm any of you because of him. On top of everything, on top of everything we discussed with this episode... The, the fact that you have a, an antagonist that we empathize with, greatly empathize with, and empathize with more and more as the episode progresses, because not only are you dealing with the, the love between Nora and Winston, where uh, he, you know, Winston changes back into the Vendorian form and says, can you love me like this? Now you're talking uh, another level of empathy that it's about being valued, that the Romulans mm. made the Vendorian feel valued, have a purpose. And that is it's, you know, something that took this to another, really another level that I was not expecting. Yeah, it, and I'll tell you what episode it reminds me of. This very much seems like Space Seed to me because at the end, you know, we, we, we have someone who is a bad guy who put the Enterprise in serious danger, we also have this love story. And we have Anne having to make a decision, just like Marlon MacGyver's has to make a decision. And we know this guy's going to go on trial. In this case, this trial's not going to be here. But again, the difference is the difference between a Ted Knight-voiced alien and Ricardo Montalban, you know? Well, well, also, like you point out, actually, they really brought up a good point with Marlon MacGyver's because what do we... What did we observe about Marla MacGyver's when she's called to the transporter room in the first act of Space Seed? She's about to put on her, you know, sort of apron to start painting. And when she grabs her tricorder to go to the transporter room, she seems irritated. She doesn't really have a whole lot to do on the Enterprise. She doesn't have a purpose. And it isn't until she falls in love with Khan. And, you know, Khan, you know, is using her. And maybe he really does love her. He, he, he does love her eventually. By the end, I think. By the yeah. end. But she has a greater purpose, just like you're talking about the purpose of, of the Vendorian in this episode, and like you're talking about the purpose of a starship captain in the ultimate computer when you're being threatened with automation. Uh, so, so having value and having purpose is something that has been explored many times before in Star Trek. Yeah, and, and, and I'll stop belaboring this point, but in all of those examples, you have the time to develop them, you know? Exactly. And so, like, we, I mean, you really feel that relationship between Khan and Marla MacGyvers and the back and forth and the attraction and the resistance and the pressure and the decision making. Is she going to destroy, is she going to betray the Enterprise and all that stuff? You really feel Kirk's sadness in the ultimate computer. Sure. You know, mm -hmm. those emotions aren't really here, but the story elements are here. Um, and basically, she says, hey, can I be the security guard, essentially, so she, he and I can kind of talk this out and 
figure out what we're going to do. You have the guard detail, Lieutenant. In the last moment of the episode, which is very much back in classic Star Trek. If he'd turned into a second Spock, it would have been too much to take, perhaps. But then two Dr. McCoys just might bring the level of medical efficiency on this ship up to acceptable levels. Very, very much a coonism from yep, and a good late, one. I, yeah, 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 yeah. It was a good moment. It worked. It's a shift in tone, and it it really works again. Another element that does make this feel like a vintage episode of the original series. So what's interesting is that you know we talked about the adaptations written by Alan Dean Foster, where he greatly expanded upon the animated episodes to mm. almost feel like live action episodes. And in this one for the survivor, uh, the story took place during a Christmas celebration on the enterprise, which I thought would have been, if that actually got filmed as a live action and you put it, you know, set it during Christmas on the enterprise and, and talking about having the time to explore all the emotional depth that you felt kind of got shortchanged with the running time here, this would have been a, a damn fine live action episode. It's funny you say that because I just occurred to me, you know, we always do our, our wrap ups at the end of, you know, and I assume we'll do a wrap up at the end of the animated series. I just figured out a question we definitely have to answer, which is which episode of the animated series would you like to have seen expanded into an episode of the original series? Mm, okay. This is definitely one of them, especially after this, yeah. This discovery and this conversation. So one of the things when I teach screenwriting that's really, really hard is just getting your story to make sense. The character's motivations lead them to have these actions. These actions basically make sense. And you can follow the story to the beginning, from the beginning to the end. And while that might sound like the most basic thing in the world, frequently for my screenwriting students, it's really, really hard to do. They really, really struggle struggle with just telling a story that makes sense. And other than the fact that I don't really understand why the Romulans leave, I do think, beat by beat, this story totally makes sense. I believe it's completely within the Star Trek realm. It totally explores Star Trek ideas. The characters absolutely behave the way the characters should, down to the jokes and the little digs with each other. All that stuff completely works. It's just emotionally isn't there for me because it's just too short to pull off what it's trying to pull off. But in terms of a Star Trek story, beginning to end, totally works. It absolutely works. And I got to say that time and time again, since we started doing our deep dives into the animated series, I've been continually impressed by how well the animated series episodes have felt like original series episodes, despite the limitations of the running time, despite the limitations of using the score over and over again, despite the limitations of the animation, which really was not, it was, it was fine, but it wasn't great. So here's another episode that I feel is very different from the five episodes we have done prior to this. It feels unique. They're not doing the same animated series over and over again. They're not phoning it in. They're putting a lot of thought into the animated series. And I feel like The Survivor is a great blend of action, adventure, excitement, heart. It's It's got humor, like especially at the end there. Uh, it's provocative by making you think, could you love something that is physically not with the uh, what is familiar to you and what about the value and the purpose, you know, having feeling like you have value. I think, I think the survivor juggles a lot. And for the most part, it, it juggles it very, very well. And I think it is a standout episode, certainly for, for an episode that I think I'm really, I'm seeing for the very first time. It felt like all the great things that make Star Trek, Star Trek. So that's what we think about The Survivor. Of course, we'd love to hear your thoughts. And one of the best places to go is to our Facebook page, where there are always, always great conversations going on about Star Trek. If you're not into Facebook, you can go to Twitter, where we are enter incidents. But, you know, there's weird stuff on Twitter, and some people aren't into Twitter these days. And so you could go to Enterprise Incidents on Instagram. Of course, we'd love you to subscribe to the show if you haven't already. You could do that on Apple Podcasts. You can also do it on YouTube or Spotify or Stitcher. But if you are an Apple Podcast and you haven't left us a review, we really would appreciate those reviews. And if you want to support the show, you can do it at uh, Anchor, which you can find by just going to the show notes and click on the show notes and you can support the show for as little as 99 cents a month, as much as 9 dollars 
a month. And if you want to find me, I'm SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. And I was thinking about movies that have spies or people undercover. And uh, that led me to some of the episodes we've done on the cinephiles. Three Days of the Condor, a classic cool. 70s uh, spy film. Of course, there's Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards, which has some very interesting spy things, particularly one down in a cellar and a couple of at Brad Pitt pretending that he could speak Italian. And we are now <laughs> we are now deep in the middle of a story about an undercover cop with Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs. But then I also thought, you know, if you're just into movies where an alien pretends to be different people, you can't do much better than John Carpenter's The Thing. Oh, well, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Movie Mance. And like Steve said, any generous donation you can make to us on Enterprise Incidents would be most appreciated. We love doing this week after week. So any support you could give there would be would be awesome. And definitely make sure you go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for us. Maybe, maybe you just haven't had a chance yet. You've been listening to us from the beginning or you discovered us along the way and the podcast is over. You move on to the next thing. Take a moment. Go to Apple Podcasts, leave a review for us. We really, really appreciate that. And be sure to share Enterprise Incidents on your social media platforms so more people can discover Enterprise Incidents and get on board with what we are doing with Star Trek. So thank you, as always, for your support. And please join us next time on Enterprise Incidents. We, we dive deep into the infinite Vulcan. The Infinite Vulcan is next on Enterprise Incidents, so please join us, and until then, keep going boldly.